Hello, hello everyone, it's Martin A.K. Anders, and today we're going to be covering a topic that I've been waiting to cover for a very long time. It's one of my favorite ways to look at the game, and one that I think is going to interest a lot of you. We're going to cover triangular style dynamics and how they can be applied in Valorant. Let's jump right into it. We've already gone on a bit of a journey thus far looking at strategic frameworks. We covered the typical Riot provided roles within Valorant, and we also took a look at functional roles. Now we're going to take a bit of a step back, and instead of looking at systems that cover quite specifically agents and how they fit into a system, this is going to look more at styles and pacing and how you can use that on a broader macro strategic level. To that end, we're actually going to start quite a ways outside of Valorant. Because the topic we're about to cover here, triangular dynamics, is something that is prolific in video games and gaming in general and has been for decades. You see, when trying to balance a game competitively, one of the easiest things to do is instead of trying to make everything equally balanced so that style A has an equal shot against B and C, B has an equal chance against A and C, and C has an equal chance against A and B, you instead aim for a triangular relationship between the three where A beats B, B beats C, but C beats A. This dynamic has been around for seemingly the entire history of gaming, starting with something as simple as rock, paper, scissors, advancing to a game that could be understood by 10 to 13 year olds in the MMORPG RuneScape and its range magic melee dynamic. And then you graduate to things that are progressively more complex but based on the same fundamental theory. If you look at tabletop war games like Warhammer 40,000, there's a horde shooting space marine soup dynamic. And then we land on my personal favorite, which is one that I'm sure many of you are actually going to be familiar with, and that is the aggro mid-range control dynamic that comes out of Magic the Gathering and other TCGs. I think that this framework in particular is the one that's most apt for cross-application in Valorant, so we'll move forward with this. A quick disclaimer here is that none of these dynamics are perfectly flawless in their characterization of the games that they exist in. There's always going to be situations where something that should win will in actuality lose, and that's an underlying footnote across this entire concept. This is all ultimately theory. Moving on with this TCG framework though, we can start to elaborate on and better define a couple of these labels. Aggro is a style that will generally focus on fast pace and, you guessed it, aggressive tempo. Control by comparison is focused on permission and manipulation, and mid-range is focused largely on flexibility and dynamism. Before we start applying these to Valorant though, I want to nail down really the nitty gritty details of what these styles imply. I'll touch on each style in turn and just hit three major points. For aggro, their primary goal is pressure exertion, they're really interested in increasing that tempo to a breakneck pace, and ensuring that there's no real response that can come out from their opponent. To steal the terminology that's commonly used to discuss this in MTG and other TCGs, this style is the one that wants to be asking the questions. You're going to be probing your opponent and saying, do you have a response to this? If I push your flank, do you have a tripwire? If I multi-flash sight, are you playing positions that are easily jiggleable? As the aggro player and team, my job is to find a question that you don't have the answer to. And that will bring us to the last point I wanted to touch on with aggro. Obviously there's countless more, but we only have time for so much. And that is that it is concerned with reach. Reach abstractly is a term that's used in TCGs to refer to the last bit of damage that an aggro deck has to eke out in order to close out a game. They usually come out of the gate swinging and swinging hard, but they very quickly run out of gas and for that reason they have to have something that will get them that last little bit of the way. In our first transmutation of this over to Valorant, a great example of reach at work is the recent aggressive leaning mid-range lineups that we've seen out of Europe and the way that they play their post plants. They play explosively onto sites, often using the overwhelming majority of their utility, and then they hold just enough in reserves to close it out, using post-plant mollies as their reach. If we move over to control, it's quite a bit the inverse. 
They focus primarily on passive manipulation. Their job is to answer the questions and they're concerned with stabilizing. Stabilizing in the TCG sense is generally gonna refer to getting to a point where you are no longer under immediate threat and can start launching a counterattack on your own terms. Transferring that over to Valorant is quite a bit convoluted because unless you've killed all of your opponents or you have perfect information, the assumption is that you will never be in a state of not being under potential immediate threat. It's for that exact same line of reasoning though that stabilization when we do bring it over to Valorant has a primary concern with info. It wants to know exactly where its opponents are going and functionally allow them to go where they want them to go. This comes into play when you have teams that are running controly setups and playing for full retake. It's not that they can't stop you from playing the site, it's that they've created a situation for themselves where they're allowing you to take that site so they can retake it under their own conditions. If I have two deep site trip wires as well as a retake camera, I'm alright letting you take A on Ascent under the preconditions that I know I am set for the retake. Meanwhile, I've created deeply entrenched positions on mid and B, so I am saying your only option is to go where I want you to go, otherwise I will stop you in your tracks. For me to stabilize in that situation, one of two scenarios needs to come to fruition. Either my opponents push into my entrenched setups and I say, no, you're not allowed to be here. I kill one or more of them and reduce their options while gaining significant information or they go into the site that I'm playing retake on, I allow them to take it, and then I play full five stack retake with a presumed advantage due to the way that I have staged that site for myself. And that will bring us to the last and most abstract of the three in mid range. Mid range focuses on reactionary attrition. That phrase is a little bit confusing in itself, but I'll elaborate on it quite a bit further when we start talking about interstyle relationships. Midrange also both asks and answers questions, and it's concerned primarily with its opponent's goals. If I'm playing a midrange setup and I see that my opponent is starting to stage for an exec, they're taking progressive space and maybe they've aldroned their way into garage on Haven, I as a midrange team will say, okay, their presumed goal here is to establish that space and prep for a C hit. I am then going to use my high volume of utility that comes with me as a mid-range team to take back that space and simply beat them on a value basis. I am trading my utility for theirs and due to the way that I've designed my composition as a mid-range setup, I can do it more freely and be less punished for it. That will cover the main three styles though and now we can go a little bit deeper and start talking about how they interact with each other. To start we have the premise that aggro is supposed to beat control. The rationale here is that to use again a TCG term, aggro goes under the control setups. It punches with such aggressive pace that it goes under the time frame that control would need in order to stabilize. There are corroborating elements of this in literal Valorant agent abilities. If we take a look at Jet, for example, who is very aggro leaned in her design and you take her trademark ability of Tailwind, it has the ability to fly through tripwires. You could not come up with a more on the face example of an agent that is designed to burst through control at an unparable pace. If we move over to the control beating mid-range dynamic, this is probably the least easy to understand of the bunch because it relies so much on cerebral play from the control team and the incremental gleaning of advantage via information. Mid-range generally wants to move reactionarily to the pressure exerted by its opponents, but control isn't interested in exerting pressure. Mid-range generally can't produce the pace that they would need to go under control's setup, and so instead they can't prevent control from stabilizing. You'll have a mid-range comp progressively taking ground towards a site to exec, but at the same time you have the control team gradually restricting map and gaining free information. And that will finally bring us to mid-range beating aggro. This is where mid-range's ability to win a war of attrition really comes out on top. Where aggro will try to play fast and explosively take space, mid-range has all the tools and then some to not only counteract that at the point of impact, but also retake it in response. 
You'll have instances where something like an aggro team's Phoenix will flash into a segment of space, but then is answered by a breach counter flash followed up by an owl drone. That might seem like a grossly disparate use of utility, but a properly formulated midrange comp will very happily trade that utility out for one of two flashes on an aggro team's Phoenix. The comparative value of that utility in each team's grander architecture is not close to equivalent. I've been plenty long-winded at this point though, so let's move over to the most exciting part of this, applying these stylistic concepts to Valorant's agents and compositions. I think that generally speaking, doing anything in absolutes when it comes to style dynamics is a little bit misleading, so we're going to take this triangle and create more of a Venn diagram with it and use that to divide up Valorant's agents. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go over each agent here in detail, otherwise we'd be here for an hour plus, but overall, this is where I place every agent that currently exists in Valorant. There are some that are very obvious, agents like Phoenix and Jet landing in an aggressive corner, agents like Cypher and Killjoy landing in the control corner, and agents like Sky and Breach landing in mid-range. Assuming you've intaken everything we've discussed so far, none of those should come as huge shocks. Taking this ever further though is when you can take these agent-specific style dynamics and apply them directly to a composition with a scoring system. If we look at this composition that I have, it's just a typical North American standard. I've assigned a primary style type and a secondary style type to every agent in the bunch. We have Jet as a both primary and secondary aggressive agent, Cypher as both a primary and secondary control agent, Omen as a primary control secondary aggro agent, Phoenix as a primary and secondary aggro agent, and Sova as a mid-range control agent. If we use a scoring system, you should obviously allocate more weight to a primary type over a secondary type, and so for each primary, an agent will be assigned two points in that style, and for each secondary, they'll be assigned one. That lands us with a compositional dynamic of a very heavy seven-point aggressive lean, a near non-existent two-point mid-range lean, and a six-point control lean. On an overarching basis, this actually pars incredibly well with the widely perceived style that North America has, where they're either playing extremely aggressively or they're playing a very slow paced control -y default into an explosive exec. The comp lacks the mid-range toolkit that it would need to take and give space repeatedly throughout a round, and so it's very binary in that it is very passive or very explosive and not often anywhere in between. Adding two other compositions into the mix, we have a Jet Cypher Omen Breach Sova configuration, that single duelist style that's prevalent in Europe and Korea, and then in the last slot, we have one that's a vague analog of those mid-rangey comps that I've referenced that Fnatic and a couple other EU teams are currently running in Jet Killjoy, Brimstone, Rays, and Sky. If we score out both of those comps, we understand just how diverse their style is relative to North America, in spite of the fact that there's a decent amount of agent overlap. In that second comp's case, it has only a 4-point skew into aggro, a 5-point skew into midrange, and a 6-point skew into control. This very well characterizes the way that it's been played in the past. If we look at that 4-point skew into aggro, it explains away the way that Korea has played it with their very bursty Vision Striker-esque plays, although they're very single-noted. It isn't a deep enough aggro pool for them to have a lot of variety in those setups, it's just flash and dash plays that can be thrown out here and there for the most part. If we look at the mid-range setup, it also makes a lot of sense. If we look at the broad defaulting that this comp is utilized in in Europe, this pars up exactly with expectation. And that will land us on the six-point control bias, which again makes complete sense, and it applies directly to that EU defaulty style. Albeit this time, it's going to be looking less at mid-roundy progressive defaults and more at the deeply entrenched ones that we see out of teams like FPX and Heretics. Two defaults that are fundamentally different despite sharing a label, in one case, the mid-rangey defaults, you have a core presence and you expand out in a singular direction generally, the space that you want to take, and in the control default sense, it's more about having a battle line and collapsing that in on your opponent. 
it is a containment default as opposed to an expansion default. And looking at this last comp, we have a seven point aggro bias, five point mid range, and three point control. Again, we have a situation where the attributes assigned to this composition by these styles makes complete sense with how this comp wants to be played. You have a very aggressive leaning composition with double dive jet and raise in your comp as well as a burst smoker in the form of brimstone, but at the same time you also have a very strong mid-round focused mid-rangey util pool with a volume of flashes on sky as well as two entry by proxy tools and raises boombot and sky's trailblazer. The one sacrifice the composition makes is obviously that its control pool is very weak. You're bringing just enough for flank coverage on offense and maybe enough for soft info on a site or a little bit of stall when you get to defense. But that's entirely okay, there's always going to be opportunity cost involved in these sort of things and in fact, this system is a great way for a team to determine where it is taking and giving those opportunity costs in their compositional design. You can look at your comp and say, based off of the utility and the agents in our setup, our comp is at its best when playing X pace and style. Are we playing to that strength and if not, why? And that's not to say that there aren't situations where you shouldn't be playing your comp's strongest style. If we look at that first composition, the NA standard, it's very bimodal. It can play very aggressively or very controlly. If I'm playing against it with the third comp on the list, I technically can play very comfortably into both of the styles that on paper should beat the two modes that that comp has. If I get a read that the opponent with the NA comp is trying to play a control -y round, I'll switch into my aggressive mode and smash through it. Likewise, if I see that they're trying to play an aggressive round, I'll lean into the mid-ranging elements of my composition and try to force the round out to an extended period of time and win off of utility attrition. You may say, well, okay, that just means that I should play a balanced composition that can switch between all three styles, but there's also the question of magnitude. There will be situations where, despite the fact that I can play control well, and that should in theory be good against your mid-range, your mid-range capabilities are so far superior to my controlly ones that you still trounce it. It's that classic jack-of-all-trades master of none conundrum. All in all, this system and overarching stylistic theory is pretty difficult to get concrete backing for. Obviously, it all checks out on a logical basis, and there's a lot of evidence coming from other types of games, but here where we see a lot of instances where you do have that bimodality and ability to switch between styles in certain compositions, it's not as linear as you may like it to be. There will be instances where the statistics are going to be muddled by a team that simply chose the wrong mode for a given round despite the fact on paper they had the tools to win it. Nonetheless, you all know how into data I am, so I would be doing myself a disservice if I didn't at least pull the data, and this is what I found. Over what is now creeping up on 200,000 rounds of professional gameplay, all of these dynamics hold up. These margins of success are a little bit small given the level of weight I put on this stylistic analysis process, but given how many other variables are at play here and Again, that weird multi-mode facet that we'll get with a more complex game like Valorant, the fact that they're evidenced at all in the statistics is incredibly impressive to me. All right, that will wrap us up for this mastering macro. Again, this was the concept that I was really the most excited to get out to you guys. I have been a Magic the Gathering player since I was literally six years old. I've been playing this game for two decades. I've competed at incredibly high levels. All of my best friends have competed at high levels. It comes as naturally to me as breathing and is an immense comfort zone. So to be able to transfer it over to Valorant in a way that not only intuitively makes sense, but also has quantitative backing to it is completely insane to me. And I love every second of it. I'd love to hear down in the comments below what your guys' thoughts are on this. How many of you are TCG players who have come across this methodology before? And maybe you've even thought about applying it to Valorant yourself already. Would love to hear about that. Per the usual, if you're enjoying my content, don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.